So let's start, Henry. Can you tell us how you actually met Howard Alexander Dumble? Well, here I am in Santa Cruz, California, where I lived. I live now. I did not live here back in 1977. In 1977, I lived in Oakland, California. But I was in the town next to Santa Cruz, Capitola, and I was playing music in my friend Chris Muir's garage. Chris Muir, a great guitarist I still play with today. And we were playing with several friends I still play with today. We were playing in the garage. And we thought it was summertime, 1977. We thought, let's take a break. We'll go outside. So we uh, opened the garage door, went outside, and a guy, a big guy, pulls up on a Vespa, a little kind of smaller motorcycle. It's a little small for him. And he says, hey, are you guys playing music in there? Are you a band? And we said, yeah, we're playing music. We're just jamming. And he says, my name's Howard Dumble. I make guitar amplifiers. Do you want to try one? And he just heard us playing on the street as he drove by. And we said, sure. He says, I'll go get one. I'll be back in 10 minutes. He goes away, comes back in 10 minutes with an overdrive special covered in pigskin strapped behind him on this little tiny Vespa that's, he's quite wide. And uh, he brings it into the garage and he spends two hours with us, showing the amp, showing us how it sounds, plays with us. We just have a great time. And the amp is amazing, like nothing we've ever heard. We've never heard an amp that's sustained that way. You know, this is before two channel amps, before um, amps with many amps with master volumes. It's 1977. That's a while ago. And this amp is like nothing we've ever heard. It's amazing. And so we exchanged contact information and I'd go visit him when I came to Santa Cruz and I really wanted one of his amps, but they were, they were expensive. They were $1,500, $1,500 back then. But uh, by the time a couple of years had passed, I had one of his amps and then I had another a year or so later. And uh, then my friend Amos Garrett, who had Steel String Singer number one, the first Steel String Singer that Dumble built, uh, wanted to sell it to get uh, two Roland Jazz Chorus amps. And again, this is like a, a ridiculously low price. I said, I'll get it. So early on, I had three just super excellent Dumble amps. Um, and I spent a lot of time with him. When he still lived in Santa Cruz, we'd have meals together. We'd talk about stuff. I'd go over to his house. I remember one time he said, hey, Henry, did I tell you I'm a photographer as a hobby? And I was like, no, Howard, you never told me that. I said, well, just admit, let's have a slideshow. And he very elaborately sets up this carousel, old kind of slide projector that had a magazine with a bunch of slides, sets it up. Does, has a focus slide first, gets it focused perfectly on the screen. Then he sits down next to me in the couch and he hands me the wired remote control for the slide projector. He says, go at your own pace. Go as, fa go as fast or as slow as you want. So I take pictures of two things. I take pictures of sunsets and I take pictures of naked women. And, and I've <laughs> alternated them here in this show. And so it's really kind of strange and uncomfortable. How long am I supposed to stay on the slide of the naked moment? Am I supposed to stay longer on the sunset? Really nice sunset, you know. You know, uh, he's a character. Wow. You know, he wow. was a yeah. those days very jovial, very guy with a terrific sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, he'd uh, come by strange paths into. Uh, being a guy who made custom guitar amplifiers, one of the first guys to do that. I mean, Red Rhodes, a few other people were, but he was the most pro prolific at that time of people making custom amps, and he found many celebrity clients. And he would develop the individual amplifiers that each client had together with the client. He'd listen to them play. He'd want to go see them live. He'd try to make it do what they want. He'd play their guitar through the amp. He'd keep changing things till he was happy with it. Then you had your amp. And then two years later, he might call up and say, hey, uh, you've got to send your amp back. I want to make some changes. It'll be better yeah. for you. And then you'd send the amp back. And sometimes it'd come back in two weeks and sometimes two months and sometimes six months. Uh, but, it would, you know, I sent mine back 
three or four times until it was mm. six months. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that was so, a long, long time. So, so um, some people, Henry think that um, Dumble would actually take two years to make an amp to like play it in. Would no. you agree with that? No, no, no. He might take an order for amp and get behind on somebody, but you know, in, in those days, an amp would be delivered in two months back in this, you know, when they, when they were the early users, you know, Lindley, Steve Bruton, uh, Lowell George, Christopher Cross, people who were the original uh, Dumble users, uh, things were pretty quick and snappy in those days. And mm -hmm. the prices had not become astronomical yet. But was he working out of his home or from a shop or something in those he early had days? A, he had a little shop that was a couple of blocks from the ocean at a, a, a place called Pleasure Point in Santa Cruz and and uh, a surfing spot just off where he was was called Outside Pleasure and one of my my first solo album was called Outside Pleasure after that 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 right. amp and the experiences with him. What, what Henry one of the most famous things on on the internet really with Dumble is is a video of you and him and, and playing together. Can you tell us about how that came about? Well, I'll tell you about that. And then you can show it because I dropboxed you the clip and we can splice it into the show or put it at the end. So, uh, I, you know, I was good friends with Dumble. I was making my first instructional video in 1986 in uh, Southern California. I'd gone down there to do it and there was a band and everything in it, but I didn't want to keep the band around too long. And I want to demonstrate all the effects I used and my amp. And I, I was the first person to really use studio rack effects in the effects loop of an amp. I did that before I had the Dumble and uh, I did it with an Acoustic 115. That's the model number of a, a acoustic company, electric guitar amp. And that had an effects loop. Not many things had effects loops then. And uh, so I developed that. So I, I kind of go through it the young callow youth that is me in this video goes through a demo of some of the things I do. I, I've trimmed that down in a clip for you mainly so you can see Dumble and I mm -hmm. playing together and Dumble playing a Valley Arts Telecaster. And uh, he's had a really strong groove. He was a cool guitar player, but we were pals. And so, and since he was there in LA, he'd moved to LA from Santa Cruz. Uh, I said, hey, can you come over and play rhythm guitar? He said, sure, I'd love to. And it's interesting as well because what you know I've always loved your playing. You're kind of a hero of mine, uh, and uh, and it's funny how now you've got all these young players now, almost you know copying basically what you did thirty years ago. Well, I you know because I bought that technology first and tried it for guitar, um, and then other people followed uh, using it in racks, and uh, then after that people start to make pedals that the rack mm -hmm. in those days, the big rack systems did. And uh, people have eventually, you know, in the last 10 years have gone to the, the exotic things like, you know, stutters and glitch pedals and backwards guitar and all those things, which I really did a lot back in starting in 1976 or so. And did Dumble uh, have, did Dumble have to kind of, um, how did you interface those effects with the amp? Did Dumble sort of? Well, so I asked for an effects loop in my amp and they didn't have effects loops yet. They only had a line out. And so I think I'm one of the first amps with an effects loop. And then after a year or so, I see, I'm saying, you know, I now I used to just have a couple of rack effects, a compressor and a simple digital delay, but now I've got a pitch transposer, a harmonizer, you know, all these things in there. And why does it not sound as good? And he says, oh, impedances aren't matching. The levels aren't right. He says, I have an idea. Let me make you something in an interface box. And so he, that's the first uh, dumb later that he made was made for me, which was for isolating and balancing different effects loop levels. That what, And there's a few amps that have it built in, but it was a single rack space one. You have something like that there behind you, don't you? Yeah, yes, yeah, you do. This is, um, I don't know if you can see this guy. So this is, this is basically it made by, um, a Swedish guitar maker called, uh, Tommy Cougar. I missed it blues amps, but so, so uh, it's a, you know, it's a buffering preamp and, and re yep. signal recovery thing. Um, I sold mine many years ago. 
probably 15 years ago. I think it ended up with John Mayer. I don't know where it ended up, but I think that's where it ended up. Um, so, you know, he, he would see my setup. He'd come to gigs if I'd play in L.A. And I'd go over to his shop and set my stuff up. And he always um, wanted to improve things for his clients and make things better. Same with Lindley. Same with other people I knew, uh, you know. Um, I mean, I, I love um, Sonny. You know, there's a lot of sly guitar players like Sonny Landruff and um, Lil George and Rikuda that have used, you know, I guess that's come from Lindley, hasn't it? That That's... I, I think it did. I think that, uh, let me, let me get rid of that noisy thing in the background. Um, I think that came from Lindley, you know, Sonny actually first played, uh, one of Steve Bruton, Steve Bruton's Dumble Amp, which was a, a lower power one with four 10 inch speakers and fell in love with it. And, uh, Sonny was telling me this on the phone this morning, we were having our farewell Dumble talk. And, uh, he said he really loved Steve's amp, and then he was in some town where it was available in a rental place. A Dumble was, so we rented one, and he was crazy about it. And he contacted Dumble, and Dumble says, "I can make one for you, and if you like that one, I'll make it like that one." So he made it like that one, right. and then they they'd get together yeah. and you know tune it up. Was that, and was that Andy Brewer? Was that a guy called Andy Brewer or something? There was a guy called Andy Brewer. Who used to have a Dumble for hire many years, like twenty years no, ago? Years. No, this is somewhere in the in the. I can't remember if we said it was Nashville or where it was, but this right. was somewhere right. else. I mean, there were there used to be Dumbles in you know studio and instru instrument rentals and rental houses before they became astronomical, because he made quite a few amps in the early days. There's probably less production, maybe. Uh, you know right. amps per year as time goes on but but they were around and i you, people in santa cruz since he lived here there were a couple of dozen double owners here and now most of them have gotten old or died or sold their amps uh for bigger money probably 20 years ago sold it for bigger money but not as big as the money is now for them mm. and and stephen bruton was a very interesting you know a really great artist and 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 he had a great tone didn't he with he played a lot of prs guitars didn't he <sighs> Maybe in the in the later years, but you know, because I'm old, older than you, you know, I think of what what these guys played in the '70s or '80s, so <laughs> when there were no PRS guitars. But you know, he's one of those guys who had a magic touch in his hands, both both hands, and you know, like Amos Garrett too, or 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 Lindley, or or, or Robin Ford, or that seems to be a common thing among Dumble users mm -hmm. is that they have they're really good. At, right hands if they're right handed right. players and they can produce lots of different tones. Uh, and I wonder if the amps taught us that a little bit too, because I know the amps I'd had before the Dumble, I'd had the acoustic 115. I had a, a champ and uh, I had a, I can't remember the number, but a Galeon Kreuger 200 W or something like that, which is the amp that, Carlos Santana, oddly enough, plays at uh, Woodstock, which I didn't know till fairly recently. Um, but that's one of the first two channel amps. I think it's maybe the first two channel amp. Uh, and the Dumbles are overdrive channel amps. They aren't real. They don't have two sets of tone controls, generally speaking, mm -hmm. unless there were some one-offs I don't know about. Uh, but uh, you know, Dumble set a very high mark which few people who can, can touch, you know, there's many, many, we could, we could, if we thought about it, we could probably list 10 people who make D style amps and 20 people who make D style pedals and very few have the magic. A few do and kind of broke the code or figured it out or have big enough ears connected to their brains. I don't know how it works, but there's nothing like the best, Dumbles. There, there. I mean, I've played many different Dumbles, and when you play the best ones, it's amazing. One that Carlos had now, which used to belong to a guitar tech pal of mine, Gary Brower in San Francisco, who had a guitar repair shop behind Re, uh, Real Guitars. Uh, he had a reverb overdrive, and that was the best sounding one I've ever heard. Right. And uh, it's uh, a friend of his bought it. And then that friend eventually sold it to Carlos, and Carlos has that one now. Wow! And and talking about um, th this eccentric character that um, 
um, you know, uh, Howard was, Howard Dumble was, um, you know, can you, can you sort of share any anecdotes, uh, any light on some, you know, anecdotal sort of meetings with him? Well, I remember one time in 1992, after he'd moved to LA, um, I was on tour with two musicians from Madagascar, Rossi, who was a big pop star, and Rakutufra, who was a seven, 70 year old master of the Sudina flute, but basically a guy who lived in a slum. And uh, they were, you know, amazed their first trip to the United States. And uh, we were, we, we, we played in, uh, in Big Sur, Esalon. We played a concert at Esalon. Then we drove down the coast uh, to LA. And I remember Rakutafra was absolutely terrified to drive along the ocean because he thought bad spirits would come from the ocean. And uh, so when we're, we're driving along with an ocean view, because he lived in the middle of Madagascar in uh, Antananarivo in the high plateau, and he just had to he, he he could not look at the ocean for fear of the spirits coming out. So we got to L.A. and we had a couple of days off. And I said, you know, do you guys know what Disneyland is? We're like, they're like, no, what's that? Well, it's a place I'd like to take you. I think you'll find it's very interesting. And uh, I said, I told Dumble I'm taking the guys to Disneyland. And he's like, can I come too? I said, sure. I said, I, and I asked my friend who's a, uh, lives in LA, who a, was a giant Disney enthusiast, and I'm sure he still is, Buckethead, uh, <laughs> who I'd known since was in high school. So Buckethead, Dumble, and I, and two guys from Madagascar went to Disneyland. <laughs> uh, Quite a <laughs> bunch of characters there. You know, we took <laughs> Rakura on all kinds of rides. We took him on the Star Wars ride, and we told him it was real. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't believe us. But his favorite things, Rakutufra's favorite things was the teacups in Disneyland. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> but but it's just, I mean, Buckethead and Dumble and two guys from Madagascar and me at Disneyland, you know, standing on the Mark Twain steamboat going down the rivers of America. Uh, you know, Fantastic. life doesn't doesn't get much better than that, does it? No. So that you've had some real fond memories, you know, of. I have really, I have really fond memories. You know, I had really good, so many, for, for 20 years, I had really great times with, with him uh, first in Santa Cruz. And then when I was in LA and then there's a period where we weren't so in touch probably from about 1997 on. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we, we got back in touch again, but I haven't heard from him much in the mm -hmm. in the past few years, I know he was just living in Bakersfield in a friend's house, and mm -hmm. he'd had a uh, laparoscopic surgery procedure. I imagine mm -hmm. it was coronary of some kind. And uh, about twelve or thirteen days ago, uh, it, things got bad. Heart mm -hmm. attack. Heart attack. Um, was in a coma for ten days and then died. Right. Well, that's yeah. Sad. Yeah. And, and and it's interesting that, I mean, because the kind of legacy that he, for me, that he's going to leave behind is this kind of total amp genius, like you've been saying, but but also somebody that's kind of like flown under the radar, as in, you know, he didn't want to, you know, capitalize, he didn't, he didn't kind of sell out, you know, as much as he could have, you know? You know, in many ways, he was a really private person. None of us mm -hmm. know his birthday. When's his birthday? Oh. None of us know how old he is. Mm -hmm. If I did the math, I would guess somewhere between... 77 and 79 or 80 that's that's what uh sonny landreth and i were talking about that this morning like how I'm, old was he anyway i mean for sniffing uh, all that um lead solder all those years I and mean, it's not bad is it yeah and you know but in, in when he was in school before musician times he was a wrestler a wrestler a professionally competitive wrestler a wrestler so, a wrestler. And then crazy. you you may not know, I don't know, he was in Buffy St. Marie's band in 19, I think, 66. 65. Wow. So that that was unusual. Yeah. He used to tell about how Buffy St. Marie would sometimes take her clothes off in, the, in front of the guys in the band to drive him <laughs> crazy. <laughs> because I, the, cause I think he, he did support Jimi Hendrix in some kind of outfit. He did actually support, he was on a festival or gig or something, and he actually supported Jimmy that, Hendrix. You know, I would, well, so that would have to have been with uh, with Buffy St. Marie. Right. Because that's, right. that's that, 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 I think <clears throat> that was the last professional music <clears throat> thing he did of, of, of touring. This is the thing, Henry, because a lot of people forget he was he was a good guitarist. And, and when on, on, on the, 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 the tape he made with you, 
you know, he had he, he could play. Could he play. could really no, he could really play. Uh, and I remember, you know, he'd want to play your guitar through your amp and understand how your guitar. So I, for instance, I played active guitars with preamps, being a you know a child of Rick Turner and Alembic. Also, I had the Stratoblaster stuck into most guitars, and mm -hmm. he, Lowell was the only other client he had who was a Stratoblaster preamp client. Uh, right. But Lowell was like that too, so he understood right away and wanted to see how we set our games and how it was different mm -hmm. and and things like that. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And 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 it's also another thing that's really interesting is obviously here in England, um, Eric Clapton. You know, literally Eric Clapton's only now the last two years actually got a Dumble amp. You know. That, yeah, I had not even, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't read the gear page. I don't keep up with things. I was, un, I was unaware of that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. A little, you know, a little late to the party, but uh, yeah, very late, you know. Yeah. Just, I mean, literally just got in there in time, you know. And uh, he, but I mean, by all accounts, that's the, all he wants to play because I know he was borrowing um, a, an EL thirty four combo overdrive special combo at some point. Well, I think he was waiting for these two um, amps to be made, which were are kind of like Fender, some kind of a Fender Baseman reissue that he's gutted out and put his own circuits in. Yeah, that I think Dumble mostly the last few years had been rebuilding other amps, radical rebuilds of, of Fender amps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so what would I say about it? Um, so an, an interesting thing is what speakers do different Dumble users use? Because he had maybe two speakers he really liked in amps and then people would have other speakers they liked and he'd try to convert you. I was already of the JBL uh, speaker persuasion and he liked JBLs. So uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, that that's, he would, he would pick out hand pick the best JBL for me. He'd go through 10 or 15 to decide really? what to put in the amp. I remember that. I hadn't oh. thought about that for years. And I know oh. he gave me a very rare JBL speaker uh, that I had where JBL made an experimental speaker that they didn't sell hardly any of that was supposed to sound like a, uh, a more like a Jensen kind of in between. And right. he gave, he gave me one of those once and I have that mm -hmm. in a cabinet here and I mm -hmm. lent it to some people at universal audio who are modeling speakers and it was right. their, fa it was their most favorite speaker of all. And I'm sure it's in there. Well, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you this Henry after this streaming thing, I'm going to ask you what it is. Yeah, I could. I mean, it's 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 not it's not where I can easily reach it right now. Yeah. It's, in the, it's in the red cabinet somewhere. So I I can know the secret and no one else. Yeah. Uh, uh, but um, yeah. I mean, he um, because uh, he also used the Altec Lansing, didn't he? Because I've got one of those ones. I like right. The the white frame Altex. Yeah. That's what Lindley used for his tone, and right. also that's what Carlos used to use in Twins in the old days, pre boogie. And then right. Carlos would use that Altec in the book in the his boogie days to get that the classic Carlos tone. It's, but it's a speaker you have to play pretty darn loud to get mm. that tone with. I've got I've got one of those here, but I, I it's louder than I like to play. And uh, and I understand, Henry, that you were sort of instrumental in actually Carlos, you know, taking up number lamps. Oh, that's a story. Um, so I was in a band with Harvey Mandel, another great hero of mine, and another even greater hero, Freddie Roulette, the wonderful steel guitar player from Chicago. And we were playing opening for Peter Green's Splinter Group at a venue in San Francisco probably a venue that held about 250 people. And it was, I think, the first Splinter Group tour in the U.S. And uh, so Peter Green did his sound check and we sat in the back of the club. I sat in the back of the club because the other guys hadn't shown up. I was like, gee, Peter Green's not playing too much lead, is he? The other guy's playing all the lead. And then they finished their sound check. And we're doing our sound check. And uh, I'm playing on stage and I look out and, and I've got my dumbbell there. And I'm playing out in the... I'm playing and I look out in the audience space where nobody is and Carlos walks in with a guitar case. So we finish our sound check and I go back to Carlos and say, hey, you going to play with Peter? He says, Henry, I don't know. I'd like to. And you could tell he's a little hesitant. I said, should we go back and ask? He says, well, when I tried to play with him at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame show, it kind of was strange. I said, do you want us to go ask? You brought the guitar. You obviously want to say, okay, let's go ask. So we go back to the dressing rooms. I knock on 
the dressing room for Peter Green, the splinter group, and the, the road manager guy sticks his head out, kind of won't let us see in the room, and says, "Hey, I say, hey, here's Carlos Santana. Can can he sit in and play Black Magic Woman with uh, Peter tonight?" And the guy says, "No, we don't have people sit in. No, no, absolutely not." And just like kind of snarls at us, and we're like, oh, "Okay," and then we turn and we're walking away down the hall. And I look back and the guy's like still guarding the door like he's afraid we're going to come back and rush the door. And I say, hey, wait a minute. And I go back to him. I think I, I can act like a manager, too. And I think these two guys are super important spiritually to each other. They both found high spirituality in guitar tone. And these two guys have millions of extra dollars because of each other and because of Black Magic Woman. Uh, you know, a giant hit for Carlos. He made money, but giant publishing hit for, I said, come on, they've got to play together. He says, okay, I'll go ask. And he goes and asks and uh, he says, okay, you can play back Black Magic Woman with Carlos tonight. And I say, he can use my amp. And he goes, okay. And then closes the door, doesn't let us go in there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we play it. And so then Carlos and I go out on the stage and I show him my amp and he plays his guitar through it. And he's like, wow, this sounds great. And I say, it's my favorite amp. It's a dumb boy. He says, oh, I haven't heard. I've heard the name once, but I don't know much about it. And uh, I tell him a little bit about it. And then it's time for the Splinter group show and the romantic is okay, Carlos is the next song. And I'm sitting with Carlos and Carlos goes up and he goes up on stage to play Black Magic Woman. And Peter doesn't introduce him. Nobody says everything. Carlos plugs in. They just start playing Black Magic Woman. Carlos is like, okay. Peter's singing. It gets to the space for the solo. And nobody plays a solo for a chorus. Nobody even looks at Carlos. And Carlos kind of goes, mm. okay. And then Carlos plays Peter Green's solo off the original Black Magic Woman single. Wow. Nice. And then the next play... Without stopping, Carlos plays his solo off. Mm -hmm. Is it on a Braxis? I forget which album it's on. Yeah. He plays he plays his own solo, and then he stops, and he and people in the audience berserk, berserk yeah. audience, no recognition of it on stage. Peter, nobody even looks at Carlos. They get mm -hmm. to the right out at the end. You're thinking, okay, now they're going to have a big jam, <laughs> and and the other guitarist plays a solo, and the song ends, and Carlos is off stage. It was so weird, and I said. I said, that was weird. He says, that's what it was like at the Rock and, rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm not yeah. sure if he, if Peter's inside there, in, in there anymore, well, meaning in yeah. his body. So, it, yeah. And I did get Peter Green to sign my guitar. I should have had Carlos wow. Santana sign it too. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been something at the same day. Imagine I know, that, that was the same day. Yeah, it would have been. Can I, can I show you my um, claim to fame? Yes. I, you may have seen this already, but this is the Rick oh. Vito Dumble delay. Let's see. Hold it close so we can see. It says it says Dumble on it, yeah. but it's a it's a boss delay, right? It's yeah because um, I don't know if Rick Vito won. I guess I guess the story is okay to tell. Apparently, um, well, my good friend very Rick Vito gave me this, and when he gave me it, he said, you know, it was used on all the Fleetwood Mac tours and. Um, um, but the reason he ended up with Dumble's boss delay was because he gave him a um, an e a e e Echoplex, you know, the really rare yeah, yeah, Echoplex. Tape, you know? tape one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Dumble says, I'm going to fix it for you, but in the meantime, take this <laughs> to use, you know, as a, as a spare, you know. And, and Rick Vita said he never saw the Echoplex again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story of this. So this is worth an Echoplex. <laughs> so I know we're off Dumble topic, but just for a second. So, but since, so, you know, like Peter Green fetishists everywhere, gee, the pickups turned around. I wonder if they're out of phase or the magnets are switched. Yep. Oh, wow. uh, you know, so I had this guitar and that's mm -hmm. what I brought to that show to get Peter Green to sign. And I don't know if there's enough. Let's get some light. Can you see the signature there in the back? It's a um, little black line. Yeah. That, you come right there. Back. Yeah. Well, it's, what? Too, it's too hard you... to see. Oh wow! But but, but so but, but back to, but so Carlos, that's that's Carlos's main amp is either uh, Dumbles or some say Dumble. He'll use the Dumble clones, but uh, that's mm -hmm. Carlos's main amp and sound now. Yeah, um, and and it's, 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 it's kind of you know um, Eric Clapton's gone there, and you know Sonny Land. I mean Sonny Landreth has been a Dumble user 
you know, f- since for a long time, hasn't he? Long, long, long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and also, um, Jackson another- Brown, Jackson Brown, and Lindley, and Lil George being some of the longest ones. Uh, it's interesting what you were t- um, you, you've been telling me earlier, actually, Henry, was that because a lot of people think that Robin Ford, you know, uh, instigated the Overdrive special by Dumble going to see him. No, that's not no. quite true, is it? No, it was a, it was around long before that, and it was the first one Jackson has. Um, but it was really the voicing and everything was developed with Lindley for his lap steel or distorted lap steel sound, that mm-hmm. which is very vocal and very rich and not harsh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, a lot of it's Lindley's hands, but it's the amp too. So that that, that makes a lot of sense because you know the sound. You know, through the silver face and, and all the the other incarnations of the Dumble, um, I, I guess a lot of people say that the early ones were quite sort of gritty, maybe, and then the later ones got more smooth and more overdrive. You know, the what they call the I don't know if they called the HRM or whatever. Well, that one. it's it's different EQ, but it's also all those people are using, you know, greenback speakers, and they're not using JBL or Altec Lansing speakers. So when the speaker changed, with the later users did not use JBL or Altex mm-hmm. speakers at all. Right. So right. that's a totally different sound right there. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. That does make so, a lot of sense. so, you know, unless you take the same, the amps, two mm-hmm. different amps and plug them into different speakers to see what happened. I remember I borrowed Lindley's amp once for a gig in LA. I thought, okay, it'll be like mine. It was nothing like mine. I could not get my sounds at all. But wow. I could borrow I could borrow one from Dumble that he liked, and I could do exactly what I did. But they so they were really mm. different, really, really different. Wow. Because because I love the clean sound. You know the the blue one that you had the one uh, the, the with the blue uh, suede. That's you a know beautiful what, blue um, clean sound. You know what that's how, that that uh, amp had a great sound for playing sort of Jerry Garcia 1972 right. Stratocaster into a twin with JBLs. It did that very, very well. It, in fact, I thought that was the best Grateful Dead amp I've ever played was that uh, th- that that blue amp, which I sold a few ge- years ago to put mm-hmm. new su- new siding on the house and pit- repaint the house, which is expensive <laughs> here in California and make the property tax payment. <laughs> <laughs> you know so but that that was a uh, yeah it, i just remember it, it just hearing that the sound and it was a very beautiful clean sound very beautiful very crystal kind of those crystal cleans you know you know it always sounded great and uh the dumble amps they never blew tubes the tubes never wore out you'd have the same tubes for 15 or 20 years wow wow so very reliable and uh yeah you know Okay, well, you know, it's it's um what what can we say? Um sad sad day for um you know his friends like yourself. You know, sad day. Well, you know, when Son- Sonny Landreth called me this morning, I could tell he was really sad, but I'd been mm-hmm. talking about Dumble with other people on the phone and remembering these stories, you know, like with Buckethead and at Disneyland with Dumble. And I was kind of like really happy because I'd remembered all the good times. And mm-hmm. I, I said, let me, I told Sonny, yeah. let me tell you how, how I met him. And, and I told Sonny some stories and we were both really happy at the end. And he told me some mm-hmm. stories. We remembered yeah. all the good times. So yeah. it's sad that he's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when we get old and, and he's yeah. old too, they, <laughs> uh, you know, our friends start to check out, but mm-hmm. I really celebrate, how much I learned about music, how much I learned about guitar, the paths I went down to because of my connection with him. He's the one who told Lindley I was going to Madagascar and Lindley called me and said, I want to go too. And I'm like, what? He says, yeah, I want to go too. And a lot of things happened because I met Howard Dumble when he drove by on his motorcycle and heard us playing in that garage. And you can, you can see my happiness and uh, about that still. And so I, you know, I mourn his passing, but I celebrate my experiences with him, and I celebrate I celebrate all the amazing guitar sounds that he sent out into the world through his clients because he sent that out through his clients. Really, yeah, really. They're, that's special. There's nobody else who's done that so much no. with no. so many magical tones through so many, yeah, you know, different portals yeah. of different players. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even mentioned Steve Ray Vaughan, and, and that's a whole other story. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, there's yeah. more. We could yeah. go on, on yeah. and on and on. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Henry. Ramon, thank you. Coming. God thank bless. You. We'll and, see you uh, soon. Speak soon. Take care. Bye, folks. Bye. So let's take a look at my amplifier now. I use a Dumble Overdrive Special amplifier. It's a custom-built tube amplifier that's best-sounding amplifier I've ever heard. Really beautiful sound, get a very wide variety of sounds. And lucky to have with me today my good friend, Mr. Alexander Dumble, who built this amplifier. Dr. D, could you explain to me just why do tubes sound different than transistors? What's the difference? Well, the difference comes down to this. Um, the more fragile harmonics can survive in a vacuum tube where they seem to be uh, eliminated or squashed in a solid state crystal lattice. And it just comes down to that. The physics of it, electrons can survive in a, a free space vacuum where they have trouble in a crystal lattice. And I think that's the best and simplest I can put it. Huh, thank you. Let me show you an example of this stutter effect. I really like this one. Play something kind of low down for me, please. Thank you, Dr. Dumble.